The media and the entire political dispensation launched a virulent attack on CPI, branding them as traitors. A headline in the organizer, organizer again the RSS paper, boldly stated, and this was you know common to all other papers, uh, even Times of India, Hindustan Times, a concentration camp for all Chinamen and CPI activists, the demand of national security. That was the headline. It is, it is in such a scenario you know, that one finds the Shikaste Zidan, the book that I'm mentioning, was banned. Shikaste Zidan was actually a collection of poems by one of the best known Urdu poets belonging to the Progressive Writers Association of that time. It was compiled by Gulam Rabani Taba of Maktabe Jamia Milia and published in May 1953 by Literature Society Delhi. One of the poems by Ali Sardar Jafri in the book was Selabi Chin, the, Ch Ch the Chinese deluge which was found objectionable by the government officials. The file noting by Home Ministry officials alleged that the poem praised the Chinese revolution and, it, and its impact on revolutionary anti-imperialist movements in Asia. The officials also brought out that the poems expressed the hope that the Chinese revolution will advance and travel further to India. It is under such circumstances and the prevailing mood in the country that in March 1961, two posters in Urdu as well as in English appeared in Jama Masjid area. This is how propaganda is uh, you know, uh, conducted. They appeared in Jama Masjid area, a prominently Muslim area, urging the government to ban the book. The poster were titled, and the, the title of the poster was absolutely different from the content. The poster was titled, Detain the, and Prosecute All Those Like Sheikh Abdullah and Brizullah Sarabai Who Are Busy in Torturous Activities of Inviting China to Attack India. Now, incidentally, both Sheikh Abdullah and Sarabai were close to Nehru and were in no way connected to the book under discussion. <coughs> the poster went on to state, Recently, we noticed a collection of poem, Shikaste Zindan, by Gulam Rabani Taban, in this, in, in this collection, this traitor and unfaithful person has written a poem under the caption Salab Echin, which runs into many pages and is full of praise of China. In this, in this poem, this man has compared China with Almighty himself, because it was Muslim, so you know, reference to Almighty always comes in. Giving the gist of verses in the book, the poster further stated, Russia and Eastern Europe are shining with prosperity and we are also eagerly waiting for such a current of happiness. China is shelter for the shelterless. This is the poem's saying. And is like a cup of poison for people like Churchill, Nehru, Patel, Truman, Marshall and the quiets like Chiang. This was being written in 1950s. Uh, it forces its... Uh, will to continue to advance from and it says the Chinese revolution and the Chinese advance should reach from Malaya, Burma, India, Palestine and then to Greece and Spain also. It's a storm that cannot be stopped. And the poetry said, oh Chinamen, go on advancing and attacking. <laughs> the poster again says, did you notice what this person has said about China? which is occupying thousands of miles of Indian territory as aggressor, and which, on the other hand, is plotting with Pakistan on Kashmir question. So these are, this is the discourse which is still present in India. You know, it was present then and it is still continuing in India. The fellow Ghulam Rabani, who is an Indian national and who seems to have forgotten that his Maktabe Jamia, whose managing director he himself is, is garnering lakhs of rupees through the patronage of national government and other official sources like government libraries and Pandit Nehru himself is donating to this. And this book he's saying is praising China and asking her to attack our country. Uh, no, there was nothing in the book about attacking because the book was written much earlier. Why all this? This is only because, and there's a poster saying again, why all this? Because our national government does not take any strong action against such traitors like Arnab Goswami speaking then. <laughs> On the other hand, these persons are rather being honored. They are invited to official functions and are being given financial assistance. 
Now is the time for Indian people and Indian government to think over this matter and how long they will continue to tolerate such traitors. And when will the government machinery come into action against them? And it was issued by those lovers of the country and of freedom who are dead enemies of traitors and the spies of foreign countries. Now the provocative poster was actually printed and pasted by a gentleman called Anwar Ali Dhelvi. He was an activist uh, belonging to the right-wing Hindu. This is what has been told to me by the family of the, uh, the editor of the book. Uh, the public relations officer of the local administration in Delhi had found Anwar Ali guilty of printing a poster without mentioning on it the name of the publisher and the printer's detail. So on 17 June 1960, 1961, Anwar Ali was convicted by the court. The person who was made the poster was convicted by the court and he was uh, given a fine of Rs. 125. Now the conviction was later set aside by the government and uh, you know the central government remitted the amount. Delhi government had fined him and central government. Now this was a typical case of how propaganda is conducted. You know, the person and to introduce binaries and to, you know, to introduce double bind situations, uh, uh, basically. Because the person who's <coughs> printed the poster is attacked is, is fine. And then people say, look, the people who are talking about nationalism are being fined and the people who are traitors are being, uh, are not being dealt with at all. So this is how the entire propaganda was being conducted. The matter also came to notice of the central government, of course. The Home Ministry officials asked the Investigation Bureau, IB, to examine the book and present a review and propose if the book was liable to be banned. The legal officer stated on 31st March 1962 that, uh, you know, the book in question was published in the month of May 1953. The Punjab Security State Act 1953 was extended to the state of Delhi in Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, you know, some file. So the book has been published even before the Punjab Security State Act 1953 was extended to Delhi. So no action is possible under the said act. I am not sure, the official said, whether it is worthwhile to take any penal action against the booksellers who may be having few copies of the book for sale when no action is taken against the writer or the publisher and the considerable length of time has elapsed since the date of publication. So in April 62, Another official of the External Affairs Ministry, a true diplomat of course, uh, you know, ambiguously stated that the book appears to have been published when India and China were still brothers. It was not an offence in those days to do so. So it is an offence now. If it is not considered possible to take any action against the author and the publisher of the book, we should at any rate discourage the sale and circulation of the book in India particularly because of its anti-national sentiments. <coughs> now, since no action could be taken on the matter, the, it was laid to rest. But just eight days after the Chinese had moved into the Indian territory, on 30th October 1962, Farid Ansari, a Rajya Sabha member of parliament belonging to Praja Socialist Party, wrote to Home Minister Lal Bahadur <coughs> Shastri, urging him to ban the book. Now, Ansari expressed his surprise that, again, that double bind situation is bringing, uh, expressed his surprise that though its publication is an open act of treason, no action has been taken. He stated to the Home Minister that, strangely enough, Gulam Rabani Taba had escaped punishment, but the person who brought the book to the notice of the official concern was prosecuted by press officers, Delhi administration, on a mere technical offence. So, Lal Bahadur Shastriji then said, ki, okay, remit, uh, the central government should remit that 125 fine which was levied on Anwar Ali, who had stuck the poster. Now the Home Minister Lal Badu Shastri also got into action on 9th November when the war is still on. If the book is really bad, he said, then why should we not take action against those selling it? If not against the author and the publisher, this should be much easier now under the provision of recent ordinance. There had been a recent ordinance under which the book could be banned. The question is, what was so objectionable in the book that was published in 1953 to be banned in 1962? Shikaste Zilam was a collection of poems by best known Urdu poets and who proved them later also. And uh, the, of course, they were 
जोश महिलावादी महिलावाद फैज अहमद फैज जगन्नाथ आजाद अहमद नदीम कासमी सरदार जाफरी इवन निजा साहिल उद्यानवी एंड अदर्स there were so, so many of them most of these belong to the progressive writers association and some of them to the communist party the verses were largely devoted to the victory of the chinese revolution and its likely impact on the struggle of liberation across the world according to this iv report in the foreword and it's it's linked to international situation at a particular time gulam rabani tama the editor of the book recounts I quote the exploitation of the resources of the backward asian countries by western powers during the last two centuries and the present century citing the ruination of the famous weaving industry of the muslims of dhaka by british during the 19th century he stated that the state's example of rapid progress of china after the revolution created a strong desire amongst all asian nations to free themselves from the shackles of imperialism and colonialism and forecast that america which has re, uh, replaced colonial powers like england and france will meet with the dominance end now by praising china the book raised hopes of the people basically during that particular time early 50s and this is the time also uh, when the communist party was following a very different line that the end of western dominance was not just a pipe dream that's what the book raised hope that western dominance could be ended according to the iv assessment and i quote <coughs> in the poems economic progress of china has been extolled and the chinese revolution has been depicted as a symbol of freedom china has been shown as a doyen of the movement for freedom from the shackles of western imperialism in the poem there's another poem yang se ko salam a salute to yang se by poet uh, parvez sahidi in the book he goes on to say that the fury of yang se became mao's revolution In direct reference to the friendship between America and Chiang Kai Shek, the poet says, "Chiang and Truman both capsized. Friendship of Truman resulted in strange enmity." Well, what he means, but probably maybe the translation is a little off. Expressing the deep-seated anger against colonialism and neo-colonialism, Parvez Sahidi says that neither imperialism nor any king will remain on Asian soil. Chinese way is the only way for Asian countries. Now tricks are being employed, and he is talking of neo-colonialism here. Now tricks are being employed by deceitful traders to preclude any further attack on white imperialism. Foreigners have fashioned out a shield from indigenous gold. In another poem, Nigare Chin, the beauty of China, the poet eulogizes the Chinese communist victory and says that after a long struggle. the dust on your face has gone and it is your beauty can now be seen by the admirers how the most controversial poem in the book is selabe chin the chinese deluge by sardar jafri who was awarded the gyanpeet award india's highest literary award in 1997 the poem was an all out praise of china but the underlying theme here again was the asian unity and the hope that the chinese revolution had ushered into the continent and beyond sardar jafri asked the question where is the revolution and then goes on to answer in china in china valleys resound peaks echo the names of china in a typically romantic style you know associated closely with urdu poetry jafri goes on as if remembering his beloved and he says how winds hums china's name the atmosphere smiles with china's name <coughs> china is the sweetest song for poets of universe what a splendid poem china is courage a desire a determination china is divine message a religious discourse a message it is the prize of asia the poet then like urdu poetry is also associated with uh, you know politics the poet returns to the harsh realities and says what is china ask the restless what is china ask the victims of sadness china is food for hungry clothes for the naked home for the homeless china is ointment for the wounds of penniless a wound in the heart of rich china is freedom for lakhs of crows of slaves a declaration for prisoners a shade for tree from scorching heat of capitalism 
China for Churchill, Patel, Nehru, Truman, and for the black teeth of the goites like Chiang is a cup of poison and death. So the poem is actually interspread, interspread with touch of romance, reality, and revolution. And uh, so I'll cut that short. Surprisingly, the editor Gulam Rabi Taba was neither arrested nor hounded by the authorities in 62, once the war. One reason for this was that Taba had moved from focusing on China uh, since the Communist Party too had shifted away from the Maoist militancy towards a more conciliatory tone towards Nehru's brand of socialism and his foreign policy that gave due cognizance to the role of Soviet Union in world affairs. However, more importantly, in 62, Gulam Rabi Taba was close to the establishment. He was never a uh, member of the Communist Party. Tabas' younger brother was Khurshid Alam Khan, uh, the former foreign minister and the father of the current external affairs minister, Salman Khurshid. <laughs> Khurshid Alam Khan was the son-in-law of Dr. Zakir Hussain, who was then the vice president of India in 1962. So he had the political patronage and the establishment's backing. So uh, probably he was not arrested for that reason. In an interaction with, uh, you know, Azra Rizvi and the elder daughter of Taba and her husband Mujib Rizvi, uh, uh, I personally interviewed them. And uh, Mujib Rizvi is another interesting person because he was uh, uh, he was one of the uh, you know pioneers of India-China friendship association in the 50s. Uh, there was one Pandit uh, G. Sundarlal. So both of them were associated, uh, and this Rizvi family is uh, those uh, who are familiar with Bollywood is uh, uh, are the parents of uh, director of People Live. Uh, so uh, Taba was a part of Progressive, and he had never been a member of Communist Party before independence. Taba had been in close touch with British Communist Party. This is what was revealed to me. He was also interacting with the communists who had infiltrated the British Indian Armed Forces during the war. The British had encouraged uh, during the war some communists to be infiltrated into the Indian Armed Forces. And uh, what uh, Mr. Mujib Rizvi told me was that uh, General Niazi of the 71 war, uh, you know, famous General Niazi who surrendered, uh, also used to be a part of this communist group, uh, you know, which used to discuss matters then, uh, before independence or just prior to independence. Now, if one were to extrapolate these connections, one could conclude that besides the revolutionary fervor sweeping uh, the nation and the India cells from American hostility vis-a-vis -vis China, the British were more concerned on building bridges with China at that stage. So one mention of Glaxo biscuits being sent, or Glaxo foodstuff being sent to Tibet during that period also could be that British were actually, uh, uh, you know, helping the, uh, maybe, I mean, this is just a guess. Uh, with the helping the Chinese army because they were uh, uh, they were definitely they had changed the stance on Tibet during that particular period. Initially, Indian communists had maintained an unambiguous line and supported the Chinese action in Tibet and considered the arrival of Dalai Lama to the to India as an unnecessary provocative and engineered act engineered by the CIA. Uh, however, as the media started building up the story of Chinese aggression and the incursions of the national mood started veering towards jingoism. The communists also began wavering in their stand on China. In an article written uh, on 27th October 1962, this is just about four or five days after the war, uh, in People's Daily hinted at the line that the Indian communists could adopt during the war. Now the, 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 uh, the article basically suggested that in 1929, uh, uh, when uh, you know Chiang Kai Sheikh had provocatively, uh, you know, done some action against the Soviet borders, on the Soviet borders, the Chinese Communist Party had taken a line of not supporting Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, the, the article suggested that the Indian Communist Party also must do the same because uh, uh, these people who are provocating, uh, causing provocations on the border need not be supported. And it also said, and I quote here, as a result of the reactionary policy of the Nehru government, and he was telling the communists this thing, the Indian Communist Party and the progressive forces are subjected to persecution. Each time Nehru government stirs up an anti-China campaign, he simultaneously mounts an attack on the Indian Communist Party and progressive forces. 
but large number of politically conscious workers, peasants and intellectuals and fair-minded people have not been deceived by reactionary propaganda of the Indian ruling class and stood firm for Sino-Indian friendship and waged unflinching struggles. The communist dilemma during 62 is succinctly brought out by Robert Stern uh, and, he's, and I quote here, Indian anti-colonialism and non-alignment and Soviet friendship for India had combined the best of both worlds of bourgeois nationalism and proletarian internationalism for the Communist Party. Now Peking threatened to re-establish the dichotomy between nationalism and communism and Moscow cut the Indian communist adrift to resolve the dilemma as best as they could. If it is this dilemma within the communist rank and file that was exploited for political ends by heightening uh, the contents of an old book that was written in an absolutely different time and context. The strategy of dividing the international communist movement between Soviet and Chinese supporters manifested itself in India. The India-China war actually led to the three-way split of the CPI. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. The two papers examine the border war from different uh, perspectives, both international and domestic. Uh, I think they are very productive for the research of this topic. Now, please have some questions and uh, comments. <coughs> I, I just have a suggestion for the chair. In the light of what uh, Arthur has just provided uh, the information about uh, how there was a domestic uh, constituency wanting more greater uh, line to the Americans, maybe that bit that you left out, if that would you know be put on the board as well, then uh, maybe we could have a better. So just maybe a few minutes to complete that bit. So if you permit, he can just get back that American part which he left out in this presentation. You can, you can do the American part, it's what you Sure. Um, let me see. Uh, is there, let me see. Um, let me just get to this. So what I have here is, is more the, uh, the American role um, from the Chinese perspective, Chinese concerns over, over the American war. I, I can probably do this without um, the notes, but what I was finding in the archives, and also you, you find this in a, in a number of uh, newspaper publications at the time, is this concern over Nehru explicitly as a, quote, tool, of um, the United States. Um, this idea that, that basically you're going to have American imperialism on China's southern flank through um, Nehru being sort of actively uh, sponsored by the United States. And also you had, um, you had in the Indian press some reports, this is something else that I'm going to get to in my project probably, is um, the Taiwanese role in, in this crisis. Because um, a couple of times in the Indian press you had uh, questions being raised of a two-front war on China with um, Taiwan as one which the United States, of course, saw as its, quote, unsinkable aircraft carrier uh, during the early Cold War, and then India on the other. And, you know, whose perspective that was is, is a separate question, but, but that was definitely being batted around in, in the Indian media. Um, so Nehru was, was being very heavily courted by both the USA and the USSR. They, they were very interested in, um, in having India on, on their side. When you actually had the border war break out, uh, the United States was, was doing all kinds of things to try and bring India into a, a formal alliance uh, with the United States. So initially, of course, um, the U.S., uh, U.K., uh, you know, Canada, France, etc., everybody was sending small arms, you know, uh, mines, all sorts of things, radios, uh, to India for, for infantry, uh, you know, operations. Um, and then, on the other hand, on a larger scale, you had Kennedy was moving the Seventh Fleet into the Bay of Bengal, um, you know, offering the protection of the Indian of, of the U.S. nuclear umbrella um, to to Nehru, <laughs> and of, of, at that point, Nehru had accepted, um, you know, U.S. and U.K. support um, by way of arms um, and also potentially uh, aircraft to, to deal with any. I mean, the, the big fear was was uh, Chinese aircraft coming into Delhi or into Assam. So uh, the U.S. and U.K. Were, were putting together a plan to uh, to base aircraft in in India. 
Um, right. So, so Chris, uh, to China, this this is actually some some of the I have again um, Chen Yi um, talking about this, and and there's almost this idea that um, China regretted the opportunity that this presented to the United States to deepen a, a containment policy, which in the Cold War was, was very much a reality. I mean, there, you know, today you talk about the idea of containment in Asia, and that's not really a policy, but back then it was a policy. So um, what Chen Yi is saying to the Albanians, who, who were part of the, the communist bloc, of course, but siding with them then against the Soviets, um, what is worth serious attention is that American imperialism is now sticking its hand in, trying to bind India up to its war chariot in order to take another step in controlling India and realize its evil conspiracy of internecine agent strife. Of course, the Indian people are against this, and the people of Asia are against this. Should the Indian government continue to walk according to this wish of American imperialism, this would be extremely dangerous. Um, so this is post, this is after the war is broken out, and there's, of course, a lot of military cooperation between the West and India, um, which is, you know, seems like fairly reasonable thing to do. I mean, at that point, there was no idea where this war was going to go. And uh, the Soviets had to sort of pull back and, and attend to their alliance with the Chinese, um, which the Chinese saw as, as a response to the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and, and Russian weakness. And, of course, Nehru um, reaches out to the American option, which had been extended to him for years at that point, but really um, on hold due to this uh, Soviet-American competition rather than to any problem with China. Um, <laughs> Right, so, so at that stage, I mean, there's sort of, I think, I think that the Chinese side is dealing with whether or not they've, you know, offered the United States this this major uh, strategic uh, advantage, which would, which would be very dangerous. And of course, this leads to a period of ultimately uh, tremendous Chinese isolation, and the Sino-Soviet split has fully happened. Um, and you know, at the end of that decade, of course, it's all reversed, and um, you know. India and the USSR have their friendship pact, and China's with the United States. So, so there is this also very important this strategic quadrangle that's happening throughout the early Cold War of the United States, uh, the Soviet Union, China, and India. And it, it takes various formations at different times. But the border war, I think, was was a major piece of how um, a strategic realignment of Asia happens. Uh, following that. Um, thank you. I enjoyed both papers um, immensely, um, and I have a question for both speakers. So, first of all, Jonathan, to pick up on what you've just been saying a little bit, uh, going back to um, your wider paper. Um, just wondering uh, about the what you've seen in documents so far, how Chinese explained Indian motivation. Clearly, it makes sense to blame British imperialism. It makes sense to um, uh, see things in, in terms of the kind of American threat and American imperialism as it was seen. But uh, was there no attempt to try and understand Indian motivations? Or were Indians just not credited with making their own foreign policy? Was describing people, Indians, as reactionaries sufficient to explain Indian motivations? Or was there any, have you seen any evidence of Chinese um, officials trying to understand why India might have this policy towards Tibet and the border? Um, and to at all, um, uh, just a simple question really about the reception. Um, of this poem and uh, of the book. Um, I realise that wasn't the focus of your paper, but I'm very interested to know. Clearly it was um, available more or less freely for a good nine years before it was banned. So was it read widely? Was it um, received well? Or was, was there kind of criticism? Or was it quite a small thing um, that became an issue in 1962? And, and then what was the reception? Uh, or was there any after it was banned? Because sometimes once something is banned, it then becomes a bigger issue and actually draws attention to it. So... If you can talk about that, thank you. Um, just a question to Atul. I was just interested in to knowing actually what was so particular about this book, uh, this collection of poems, uh, that made you look into that uh, particular aspect. And also, uh, in, in fact, those were turbulent times, so were, were there other works also especially by the progressive writers and the uh, left activists. Uh, some <coughs> other works in other various other vernacular languages which were also sort of uh, uh, censured or they were also under surveillance at, in those times, uh, which were also, which could have generated uh, such amount of debate. I 
Only I can speak up. <laughs> I have one uh, brief comment or question to Zonabhi. If you, you stated the, some of the facts, but I think some of them are mixed up. You have to look at the nuclear umbrella question is separate. And I think finally you said we cannot provide this <coughs> nuclear umbrella to India. That was uh, his defense secretary made it very clear to India. That is one aspect. Secondly, about the aircraft, uh, even though India wanted aircrafts, but uh, it was it is now widely publicized. So the Indian Air Force didn't use its own aircraft what was available, and it would have given an advantage to India in Tibet. Because on the, on the advice of the U.S. ambassador, that uh, that China have more numbers, whereas that planes wouldn't have taken off from Changtu or reached the <coughs> Indian border areas. So I think the was the U.S. ambassador playing a double game on the one side requesting India not to use the air. So th those facts you have to go back and the U-2 planes and. Uh, the, uh, they used the uh, Dhaka airport, but our flew Indian uh, area. So this was a cooperation, uh, as you brought out, US, Taiwan, and uh, India at least not mentioning that. I think that is the thing.